Good evening and welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. Uh, I'm Nicola Palfrey and I'd like to welcome the panellists and all of you joining us tonight. Um, those of you that are watching us live, welcome, and those of you that are watching the recording. First of all, MHPN would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, seas and waterways across Australia on, upon, upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay our respects to Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the cultures and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So welcome everybody. We have almost 460 participants joining us already. So welcome and thank you for joining us at this uh, time of the year. I'm Nicola Palfrey, I'm a clinical psychologist located in Canberra and I'll be your facilitator for tonight. We're going to introduce you to the panellists to get into it straight away. So we've got a great panel for you tonight. The bios have been distributed, so in the interest of time I'm not going to read through them, um, but let's get into it and get them um, chatting about themselves and uh, why this area interests them and what they can add. So first of all I'd like to introduce introduce Dr. Andrew Leach, who's a, a, a general practitioner from WA. So welcome, Andrew. And my first question, in our resources that you've provided with us, you talk about the Emerging Minds um, GP training that you've been uh, working with. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thanks, Nicola, and hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be back on the panel for, for tonight. Um, the Emerging Minds is a really great resource that I've been working closely with throughout this year. And I encourage um, you know, anyone in the health profession really to have a look at their website. There's some great training there for engaging children in mental health. And we've recently com completed a module that is uh, well worth doing. It takes uh, um, probably a few hours to complete overall, but there are some really great videos, interviews with children, um, and particularly an area there on grief as well. So for a bit of upskilling and a bit of training and some CPD points, um, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. And that's uh, been an area of interest of mine. Fantastic, thank you. And there's resources for families and carers as well, I know, on children and grief, so definitely worth um, checking out. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Our next panellist is Dr. Christy Felsey um, from WA. So they're joining us a little bit earlier in the day. Welcome, Christy. And I just got a question. What makes grief work different from other work that you may do? Hi. Um, hello to everyone that's watching. Um, I guess one of the main things that makes it really different is in other types of, of counselling and psychotherapy, people are often coming um, to work towards a change in their life, whereas with grief, I guess the change has already happened and it's often uh, an unwanted change and an unexpected mm -hmm. change in a lot of cases. And so the work that we do often goes quite deep quite quickly. Um, you go into a lot of emotions and a lot of depth. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just very different, um, I guess, in how quickly you kind of start into some of that deeper work. Yeah. Uh, and it's such a rewarding area to work in. That's great. Thank you so much, Christy. We're really excited to have you here tonight. And our third panellist is Julianne White, who is an accredited mental health social worker, amongst other things. Welcome, Julianne. Um, you've been working in this area of grief for a while now. It can be a tricky area in an area that people are um, mm. sometimes reticent to work in. What do you find rewarding about this sort of work? Oh, and thank you for asking that question, Nicola. I really, it's a lovely question and, and welcome everyone here tonight. It's lovely and to be um, on this panel. Look, I love grief and loss work and trauma work because as like Christy said, you get to a very deep place very quickly with people. It's very authentic. There's a holding space. And I often feel that my job when sitting with people is to validate and just hold and be witness to intense emotions that perhaps mm -hmm. other people, their family, their loved ones just might feel reticent to do or a little bit uncomfortable with and what I love is that we can revisit grief over many many years it's not something that we're fixed with grief comes back mm. many many times and it's a it's just a very lovely rewarding gentle space to work in Thank you, Julianne. I think that's what we're going to get into tonight is actually how we do that because yes. it, it is really important work and, 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 and can be really um, lovely work, but it, it's sometimes an area that people feel they're not sure if they're doing enough or should they be doing more. So it'll be great to get, to get into the detail. So welcome, everybody. We've now got over 650 
uh, attendees, so that's great, welcome. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of the ground rules uh, for tonight. Um, so of course in any space such as this it's really important that we're respectful of each other, of the participants and the panellists, um, keeping comments in the chat box um, on topic and related um, to what we're chatting about tonight would be really appreciated. If there are technical problems, and this year we've all become very aware of how technology can be our friend and foe, um, there is a number from MHPN, which is 1800 209031, or you can email webinars at mhpn.org.au. All of these tech support uh, resource information and detail are in the original uh, login details and emails that you would have received. So you can also click on the information icon, which is in the lower right hand corner of your screen and click on webcast support and they'll be able to assist you there. If your webcast freezes or stops at any time, the good old refresh button is, is also um, a good place to start. If nothing else, if everything else fails, the webcast is being recorded so you can always um, catch up at another time if, if things don't get resolved. So to introduce you to the webinar platform, a lot of you will be familiar with the Zoom platform. Um, however, let's run through it relatively quickly. So to interact with the platform and access resources, there are a number of options. So information is located on with the I circle in the lower right hand corner and you can access presentation information, links for live chat resources and webcast support. To ask the speakers a question, click on the speech bubble icon in the lower right corner and that comes through as distinct from chat so that's where we'll be pulling the, the Q&A for the, the last part of the webinar. Um, you can change your slide and video lay layout excuse me, by clicking on the icon with two arrows inside a circle that's in the top right hand corner. This makes the video larger and the slide smaller and you can change your view to slide only or video only by clicking on a square icon um, with the upward and right direction arrow on the bottom right hand corner. So we can, there'll be a survey at the end of the webinar that we will um, encourage you to do and you can gl click on that at the end of the screen as well. Okay, so what are we going to be covering tonight? So through an exploration of the case study that we sent out to you earlier, we will be looking to identify the mental health indicators in the context of grief and loss and the range of reactions to grief that children may experience. We'll discuss tips and strategies that can help a child feel safe and secure after experiencing a loss and we'll discuss the importance of collaboration and appropriate referrals when supporting a child, their family and or their carers who are experiencing grief, including supports in areas such as the school setting. So this case study was a follow on from one we used from a previous webinar which follows the story of Ben who we met two years ago when he lost his father to suicide. He continues to have some issues with sleep emotions and tummy aches. So we will um, be able to explore Ben and his family and how our panel may work with him. So we are now ready to take over to Andrew for a GP's perspective. So over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so at this point, we're meeting Ben and his mother and they've come in in a, in a real point of desperation, especially his mum, who's just not sure what to do next. Nicola, if you go to the next slide, we might start with this point that grief is a normal reaction, but it can have a wide range of uh, symptoms and feelings, emotions, behaviours. And in children, I think they, they can be quite different as well. The severity can change. And I've certainly seen children where, where there is no reaction to that grief through to quite severe disruptive behaviours and symptoms. So um, there's a little bit of uh, variation, but with Ben, we're seeing a lot of these symptoms here and feelings. Um, but recognising, I guess, at the first point, that a lot of these are a normal response to a significant change in his life. It can be age dependent as well. And at age eight, we'd probably expect Ben to have some understanding that this death is final. This is a very, you know, severe, serious complication. And he may be worried now that he is also going to lose other loved ones and is experiencing a sense of anxiety um, and fear around that. Uh, next slide, please, Nicola. So when and, and why does Ben need professional help? Um, I, I would say if that experience of grief uh, has been disrupting his home life and his school life or one or the other, 
and have become prolonged, then Ben needs professional help. But uh, the fact that his mother has brought him in to see us today is indicative that they're at a point where they do need help. And remembering that Ben has not just experienced the loss of a loved one, he's probably also experienced other significant changes in his life that are also probably impacting on how he's feeling and reacting to the world. And his mum has certainly been, has been stressed at home. He's hearing things on the phone or that his mum's talking to the police. He's, he's probably had friends talking to him. He may be experiencing bullying at school. So he's not immune to all the other eight-year-old issues that can arise. And it'd be interesting and useful to explore those with him about what is going on in his world. So I guess any of these points here, an extended period of time with any problem to do with the, 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 um, the effects of this um, death. Uh, next slide, Nicola. So as a GP, I'd be keen to explore those with him. And I've already talked about how um, engaging children in general practice when we're talking about mental health. But it, it really is about exploring his world. And the next slide I'll bring on in shortly, we'll talk a bit more about that. Also remembering that mum's part of this picture and his sister is also part of this picture. So collectively gathering, gathering some of that information. There have been physical symptoms and, and the GP does have a role to think about what might be causing the tummy pains and the, the insomnia and ensure that there is no medical cause that's going on as well in the background, whether there's any constipation, checking his tummy, giving him a physical examination um, before putting everything down to an emotional response. Uh, the DSM criteria for grief is a bit tricky. There is a DSM-5 criteria called persistent complex bereavement disorder. And this diagnosis is assigned to individuals who experience an unusually disabling or prolonged episode of grief, but it's still under review and there's still more research being completed. And from what I was do looking at in my reading, I couldn't find much in terms of this being labelled with children, but there are certainly secondary uh, diagnoses that may come to light as we're dealing with Ben. And that may be anxiety, it might be depression, oppositional defiance disorder. Grief is never um, a simple, straightforward issue, especially in this case here. There, there, are, there is a very good chance that there are overlying and overlapping diagnoses to consider, and the GP has a role. There might be some screening tools that we could do, such as the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire or the DAS21 with Mum to help us to work those out. Safety netting is really important as well. And asking Ben, does he feel safe at home? Does he feel safe at school? And ensuring that there are no risks to Ben um, in this setting and setting up your consultations. So making sure you have long consultations with Ben, making sure you're seeing him on a regular basis, really holding that family as a whole and supporting them through the process. And in itself, that is therapeutic to this family. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we need Ben to really open up and that may not be easy in an eight year old boy. He might be coming along really not wanting to see you. And so that first couple of consults is spent a lot of time building rapport. And for me, I often use that heads approach, which we use in adolescents and teenagers, which is just asking a bit about his home life, his strengths, his interests, what, what he, who his friends are, um, and working around in a bit of a circle before we actually find the key issues that are going on for him. If I'm not getting anywhere, it might be a matter of just drawing out a genogram and that can be a good icebreaker. Um, drawing out who is at home. This isn't Ben's genogram, but just an example of, you know, those first couple of generations of family members. What is his relationship with other people, other um, male figures in his family, his uncle, his grandfather, um, his teacher? Um, you know, he's lost that male role model. And, and for, for boys, young boys, you know, I, I can't imagine how significant that is. Um, I, I often normalise things as well and say, you know, another child I'm seeing who also is going through a tough time has X, Y, and Z emotions going on. Is that something you've experienced? And, and that can be a useful way to, to help Ben feel like, well, I'm not the only one in the world dealing with this and it's okay to have big feelings. Next slide, please. The presenting complaint today is sleep. And sleep uh, hygiene has become a bit of a concern in a lot of young people that I'm seeing at the moment. And it revolves a lot around screen time. So ensuring that there is no screen time, he may have turned into turn to enjoying other things like gaming and television and YouTube to wind down at night, but just ensuring that he has that really relaxing, calm, lower stimulation environment before bed. And there might be some apps um, such as Smiling Mind that he can use to help with a mindfulness program before bed. And mum could use it as well. It could be a really way, a good way to help with that bonding and that time together as they wind down for sleep. 
Um, mum may need to do some camp out in his room to help with that separation anxiety. Medications we don't use often, but there are some available and that's something that he needs to discuss with his GP. Next slide. So what are we gonna do with Ben? I think that the, the obvious thing is here, this family needs support in more ways than one. And as I said at the start, holding this family is a really good way to support them. But considering other referral options, you know, if we do feel like, and because of all the behavioural consequences of this grief, that Ben does have an emerging anxiety, then referral under a mental health care plan to a, um, an allied health professional, OT, psychologist or social worker would be really useful. We know there's financial challenges here as well. Um, involving Centrelink if needed, if mum needs a bit of time off work, doing a Centrelink certificate for mum to give her some support with funding and um, looking at psychology services that may be um, government funded. Not easy, I know at the moment, but I know there has been an emergence of telephone support services, telehealth, psychology, and I've put some links, but Head to Health is a really good way to look up those supports um, and find what might be available for this family. And I know a lot of them are government funded, so it might be a good starting point. Um, as well as the grief line, which is a phone number they can use in sort of a more urgent situation. So giving those contact numbers, letting them know that you are here from them, your door is open, we want to see you regularly, we want to work on these issues and manage them and um, following up with a re relevant allied health professional. Thanks very much. Okay, so I guess some of the common things that we find for children around Ben's age between the six to eight years of age um, is that children often become exaggerated versions of themselves when they're grieving. Um, some of their previous behaviour and coping methods are just really amplified and a lot bigger than what they usually would be. Um, and so you might have a child that uses humour and they might be using that a lot more. You might have a child that's quite loud and they're even more so loud or if they're quiet they might be even more withdrawn. Um, often their behaviour can regress a fair bit as well so they can lose a lot of skills that they've just previously mastered. Um, they can often revert back to younger behaviour um, which can also be I guess a bit confusing at the time for, for parents in particular um, and can also be a bit frustrating too um, but when you can see it in the context of grief it makes a lot more sense. Um, Children also express grief a little bit differently at different ages, um, and we can touch on that a bit later if people have questions. Um, but as Andrew mentioned, most um, children, they have an understanding at that age around the finality of death and are quite curious. They ask a lot of literal questions um, around the death and what happens to the deceased body. Um, they often have beliefs around magical thinking, and they can often blame themselves for the death, thinking that their behaviour or their thoughts um, may have caused the death. Uh, and there can be a whole piece that needs to often get explored, particularly around guilt, um, if a child is struggling with that. They can often personalise death as, um, as a person, a monster or a deity. And this can often then impact with nightmares and fear of the dark and issues with sleeping. So that could also be a really important area to explore with Ben to see if there is anything like that behind some of his struggles around sleep. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I guess some of the things that we would look at throughout the counselling is looking at, um, at how much Ben's world has changed, like his whole trust in the world has, has been broken. Um, the awareness that death can impact him and his family, it really, creates sometimes a lot of fear and anxiety around um, around day-to-day -day life and living. Uh, so it'd be really important to be able to create a safe space for Ben um, that he can share his memories of his dad and have open communication with his mum. Being able to do that helps him to feel connected to his dad. Um, I say like, even though the person is no longer alive, like that relationship is still so important and there's nothing that will replace that. So it's really important for him to have a way of con continuing that connection. Um, really important that he has a place to share his sadness and his pain and his anger with his mum and that she can reassure him that those big chaotic feelings that he's feeling are okay. Um, kids don't know how to grieve. They often have never come across this before. And so they really do look to the adults in their lives to know what's okay and what's not okay. And to also get a bit of permission around how to grieve and how to share their emotions. So really important that um, Melissa can 
have some of those conversations with him and also be able to show some of her grief to him as well. Uh, also having honesty with kids uh, in age appropriate information around the death and age appropriate information, even just around grief and around emotions um, that helps to create trust. It also just creates that security for, for the child. And even if Ben has questions that his mum can't answer, it's still really important that he feels that he can still ask them. Even if Melissa comes back and saying, well, I don't know, I'll have to think about that or I'll have to get back to you. Um, it just creates again, that connection and that closeness. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, it's really important to continue to have boundaries and routines and schedules. Um, these help to provide predictability, which turns into safety and security. It just gives the child something to lean against, especially when everything feels like, like chaos and everything's changed. It just helps them to feel like their home and their world is still, still predictable. Um, grief lasts over the lifetime and I guess the intensity of it changes over time. And so even though a few years on now, it might not be as raw as it was initially, there's still gonna be times where it spikes up or the intensity rises. Uh, so just important to be aware of that and knowing how to support Ben in those different moments. Uh, important that he's included in rituals and traditions, um, involved in age appropriate conversations and decisions. This helps to empower him and just gives him a sense of control, which also lessens that feeling of chaos. Uh, permission to still be a child, um, to, to still hope and look forward to things, um, to, to know that he can still have fun and he can still go out with friends, but also if he wants to spend time by himself, then that's okay too. If he, he, that it's okay for him to still be sad, it's okay for him to still cry, um, but that his grief is, is able to be shown in different ways and that's okay. Um, also for adults around him to show him a lot of understanding and compassion around this. Um, and I've got a quote up on the slides too that I'll read. Um, I found that no matter how long it has been since someone has experienced grief, they need to be heard. Whether the grief is only a year old, five years old or older, people need to talk about their pain. They need someone to listen. Yes, there's been healing, but the pain never quite goes away. Uh, next slide. So saying that, um, not everyone needs to see a counsellor or psychologist following a death. However, if um, there's a feeling of isolation or that they're lonely in their grief, like other people don't understand it or they don't get it or they can't talk about it, it can be really important that they have a safe space where they can explore that. Um, if they're finding it difficult to talk to friends and family, it can be really important again for them to have a person that they can have those conversations with. Uh, we often find that in the first few months, all the family and support networks are there helping and available. But after a few months, everyone just kind of disappears a little bit and families sometimes aren't as supportive about listening or hearing the story again and again and again. And so it can be really important for them to be able to see a counsellor or to see someone where they can talk about the story again and as much as they, as they need to and to share that person with someone. Um, if a child's behaviour has drastically changed, so in Ben's case, we'd say it would be advisable for him to see someone, um, particularly that he went from being quite kind and gentle to being quite angry and withdrawn. So that's quite a big shift. Um, and just ha again, having that space where he can explore that. Um, if there's really heightened emotions that are frequently expressed, such as that anger, um, particularly at surviving family members, whether that's his sister or his mum or um, other relatives or anything like that, it'd be really worthwhile for him to be able to see a professional to explore that and just to figure out what's underlying that and what's behind that for him. Uh, if there's extreme behaviours like self-harm, suicidal ideation and substance use, even though Ben's only eight, um, we are finding that substance use still starts to enter quite early and just that also he's a bit more vulnerable with everything he's gone through. Um, and also that he's just got that vulnerability around enhanced risk uh, following his dad's suicide as well. Um, and so as Andrew's kind of touched on already, like we would definitely be wanting him to follow up with his GP regu regularly around the sleeping, the nightmares, the stomach aches, the anger and the aggression as well. Um, and if there's any other physical symptoms or concerns that come up, definitely to see the GP. Next slide, please. Cool. Um, uh, as we know, healthy grief can impact on concentration, memory, energy levels, uh, which can greatly impact on school um, and learning. And so it'd be really important for him in the school environment to be able to link in with uh, the chaplain or the nurse, counsellor, social worker, head of year level, 
um, or teachers or just someone that he feels safe and connected to at school. Um, that he has a safe place that he can go when he's feeling overwhelmed, angry, tired or disconnected. Uh, it'd be also important to explore some of the reasons for him not wanting to attend school. And so whether that's the inability to concentrate, um, priority, like whether he's finding school just isn't important in light of the death, um, whether he's been bullied, whether there's separation anxiety or that he can't talk to his friends. Um, but being able to find out what's behind that could make a really big difference. Uh, and important to link mum and the family into the into other supports as well. So whether that's support groups around grief or around parenting for mum or for the kids, um, whether that's sporting clubs, faith community, social clubs, grief camps for kids or other other social areas, um, particularly for Ben to have some of those male role models could be really, really important for him. Um, that's probably a real need for him and a gap for him as well. So it could be really important for him to be able to, to have that. Um, and I guess my last point I'll just make quickly is like the little picture on my slide says, everyone kind of experienced grief a little bit differently and it looks a little bit different for everyone. Um, and so it's just, just yeah, seeing that and just being able to support them and be there for them. Okay, thanks Nicole. Wonderful. Thank you, Christy. Just before we throw over to Julianne, I just know a number of people are struggling with the, to find the chat. It's in the I information icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, chat will come up as an option and it will pop up as a separate tab. So I'll just give people a little second to maybe have a look for that um, because we know you guys like to chat to each other. We've got almost 880 people watching, so there's a few people that might want to chat. So the information icon, click on that and look for chat. Okay, hopefully you guys have got that. Thank you so much, Christy and Andrew. Um, we'll hand over to Julianne when you're ready. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Nicola, and lovely to follow on from Christy and Andrew. Um, I just think watch wonderful presentations and a great wealth of knowledge. Um, what I want to go through too is not just look at some of the other grief perspectives, but what a social worker might offer too to this to this space. But first of all, grief, from my experience, is so misunderstood and often poorly responded to because we often see the symptom, like Andrew was saying, Ben's come in with you know stomach problems and might be some time from the grief. So we don't always make the connection to grief, and grief is really. Uh, an impervious thing that sort of goes deep into the psyche of a person. It's about our schemas, our view of the world, our sense of meaning. It's a, And like I've got up there, it's a psychological, a biological and a physiological response to change where the person, regardless of their age, perceives that there's been a loss. So which means we've got primary losses, the grief, the original big loss, you know, like his father, Ben's father's death, but then all the other secondary losses that um, both Christy and Andrew have talked about as well, that actually can be just as powerful and overwhelming for young Ben or for anyone in his family. Um, and we may need as health professionals to be very aware of both the primary and the secondary losses that can come about. But what does social work bring to the table? I often think what we can often contribute in a collaborative way is a biopsychosocial approach, looking at systems, looking at collaborating with schools and you know, helping with some of the other networking and some casework as well, as well as that therapeutic support. Where we're looking at grief is not from a medical perspective and I know Ben was talking about the DSM-5 and it really does create a bit of a, a quandary for us is where we try to fit grief um, if we're looking for a diagnosis and it is an adjustment issue, is uh, a lot of other symptoms that can come out like the anxiety and the depression and the concerns. So it's really hard sometimes to find if we're going through a mental health treatment plan or looking for appropriate referrals, just where do we fit that and we what do we call it? Because um, often if we call it anxiety or depression, we miss the grief because we're just going straight to, perhaps professionals might go straight to an anxiety response rather than naming it and looking deeper. And this is what Christy was saying earlier, you know, to get deeply into the meaning behind, you know, what might be causing this. What we look at too is separating the problem from the person. So looking at Ben and his age as a little eight-year-old, but also, you know, the older brother of a sister and a father who's suicided. And I think there's that stigma, little eight-year-olds, and regardless of the age, they're very aware that this is not a normal death. Daddy didn't die of cancer. Daddy wasn't in hospital and, you know, the people were hanging onto his hand as he was dying. Sorry, Nicola, thank you for doing that. Um, so we have to look at the 
the macro, the micro and the mezzo systems that are around this. You know, what else is going on here? So at a macro level, he'd be very aware of what society is saying, what mum's saying. Like I think, Christy, you were mentioning that he would have heard the phone calls, you know, mum talking to police and then he overheard her saying something about uh, dad hung himself. You know, there's huge stigma for little boys. Do you know, what does that mean? What does it look, you know, for this family? We've got to look at the multiple perspectives that might be uh, occurring here for young Ben, but also for Madeline, his sister, and his mum, Melissa, and the extended family network. We look at attachment theory. Was there a disordered or disorganised attachment prior to this? Was there arguing? Was there some other issues that might have been going on for this family? Not just look at, yes, he's grieving his father, he's grieving his, his hopefully, his role model or you know the dad, the man in his life. But there could be things around attachment issues that might be affecting these symptoms that he's getting around, you know, not sleeping and stomach aches. We've got to use a trauma-informed approach. We can't cause more harm. You can't actually go into questions or ways of working with Ben or his mother that are potentially going to bring up um, stories or feelings that are going to create more harm. We've got to use a strengths approach of really working with young Ben around what does he do well, you know, what's in his toolbox, how does he normally cope with, you know, things that are pretty not very nice. We've got to look at values, not only Ben's values but his families, the schemas. And in my grief work I look at all of these things. I talk to people about schemas, I talk about values, I talk about what does this family, what does death mean in this family? How do the family grieve? What are the cultural perspectives that might be impacting on this family and determining how Ben cries or grieves and how he reacts? You know, what do the other men do in his family? Um, and how do they grieve would be very much important to understanding so that good grief work can be done for not just Ben but his family. And that's where we look at the family systems, what else is going on here, and the family narratives, you know, really finding out from mum. And there's a chance, you know, from other teachers, you know, just what do they know about this family and how they make sense of their world. The assessment, like Andrew was saying, you know, using the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, which uses multiple perspectives, the teacher's perspective, the parents and the child, is really excellent, and the DAS from the mother. The other one I like to use too sometimes is a HAD, the Hospital Anxiety and Depression Scale, because it takes stress out sometimes, which can be a confusing um, compounder because it has the somatic symptoms, so sometimes a HAD is really useful. But the strengths and difficulty questionnaire provides a lot of information. Next slide, please, Nicola. So the grief and bereavement also has gone through significant change. And I think all of you, you know, listening and watching and being part of this would know that we've moved a long way from um, the work that's been done originally by Warden and Kubler-Ross around stages and phases and tasks. And we now look at a dual processing model whereby we're, we're not looking, I think Christy, you mentioned it, you know, we don't look at it just as, as a linear model. We actually look at where that person is and be very, very aware that we're looking at how are they coping with this trigger or this feeling or whatever's happening for them right now. And it's about being present rather than actually labelling someone and saying, well, you're in the angry phase or you're in this phase. Or, or even just sort of saying, oh, well, grief will change with time. Grief doesn't change with time. Grief changes with exposure and with maturity and with brain development and also then different life stages that we go through whereby the grief has different meanings. And I think using models or interventions that give us a different perspective on meanings is really, and I'll go through that shortly. You know, we need to, um, just the next slide too, please, Nicola. So, you know, the adults in uh, Little Ben's life are a big influence on him, not just mum, but also other role models that might be there, teachers that are there, people that he might be looking up to to say, well, how do I, how do I navigate this? And kids do it by osmosis, you know, we don't actually say to them, well, you know, this is how you actually be a man, you know, young boys and young girls, they pick up their influences from the people around them. Like young Ben, his, his behaviours might look demanding or unreasonable. I think, Andrew, you mentioned oppositional defiant disorder. You know, sometimes they're really pushing back from everybody because it's almost like my world has been disrupted and I ain't going to let anybody else in there and disrupt it again. So maybe he's doing a bit of the pushback to everybody to go, you know what, I, I just need to protect myself. And he might be doing some of that, which means as clinicians we need to really sit very carefully and allow him to express some of that. One thing, I just had a young fellow in tonight who was nine 
And he, we did a lot of talk about what are the polarities. You know, what's, you know, if you're not sad, what are you? What's the opposite to sad? And he said, well, happy. And I said, oh, wow, really? You know, if, you, if you're not sad, are you happy? Are you happy now or are you sad? And he really thought a lot about that. You know, wow, well, you know, I can, I don't have to be the opposite to something. I can just be not that. And it was interesting to watch this little eight or nine year old just really grasp those really complex concepts. I think kids, we give them, we can talk to them in really complex ways and I think most kids tend to get it or they'll take in just what they need to hear. Next slide please, Nicola. So how Ben experiences grief will depend on how fully he understands the nature and finality of death and as an eight or nine year old, depending on what he's experienced, if he's had animals or other things in his life have died, he might have some perception of death. And how they react depends on the disruption that happens in their lives and how other people, and I'm reading, you know, from the case study, Melissa, his mum, really was struggling. So obviously he feels that, you know, what, what do we do? There's no role models that say this is how we integrate this into a new life's narrative. Um, the attachment Ben had to his father and a father image is really important. We have to actually unpack some of that so that we can help him make sense of what he's experiencing and feeling. And I often think that's our job is to look at the child's behaviour and the family's behaviour and somehow unpack it a bit like a mind map. You know, how is this person making sense of their world based on their understandings in this new world which is so unfamiliar to him. The next slide please, Nicola. Parental coping with their child's grief also involves understanding the child's genuine concerns following the death. And Nicola and uh, uh, Christy and Andrew both mentioned this as well. You know, and he's going through those polarities. You know, we're very concerned also about Melissa shielding Ben and including him, informing him, not scaring him. And this is where it's really important, I believe, to actually use real words like dead, dying, death, and not going to sleep or daddy's in the stars. You know, I just think that sometimes causes lots of problems with sleep because, you know, it's then what happens when I go to sleep? Well, that happened to me too. Or if somebody else goes to sleep and then dies, um, that can actually set up some really huge uh, perspectives on what happens and what happens when we die. And I think we can ask children about death. So what do you think happens at death? What happens to the body? Children are really fascinated by that. And if we're comfortable with it, we can actually sit there with them and go, yeah, it's really curious. And we can externalise it and name it so we don't have to be talking about dad but we can actually be talking about more broader concepts as you develop a relationship with young Ben. And I see our benefit, you know, our work is to actually work with Melissa, the family, to help establish a family life's narrative, a cohesive narrative that includes my daddy died and that's really important. Uh, the next slide please. Now this model I put up here, the dual processing model by Schultz and Strobe, is one that I might write on back of envelopes, back on any piece of paper that I have and I find this a wonderful, just an easy model that you can say to people that over here we're dealing with loss, the loss orientation, dealing with the grief itself and on the other side we're actually dealing with what we call the restoration or, or living with the loss and how the life is impacted on our lives and often the secondary losses. And what happens is that in life we oscillate between dealing with life, coping, having to go to school, having to pack your lunches, worried about who's going to drive me to footy practice and then, oh my God, this is really horrible, my daddy's not here and it's just revolting, mummy's really sad and everything's changed. And children and all of us, doesn't really matter what age you are, which is what I love about this model, it's not age appropriate but it's often situational appropriate or grief appropriate and we oscillate. I see my job as working with someone and finding triggers. What might be the trigger that takes you from coping today and being able to go to school and do your stuff to actually not coping. What will be those triggers? Is Christmas, like it's just around the corner and almost every person I'm seeing at the moment I'm saying, you know, what might be something that's happening for you right now? How can I help you work out a way so that it's not traumatising? And what I love about this model, it's useful, it's amazing, it fits, people go, yeah, I get it. So someone 10 years on, from a, a grief event or a major trauma can be oscillating because there was a major trigger. And I can imagine with Ben there's going to be times in his life, you know, when he's 16, when he's 18, you know, 16 gets his licence hopefully, 18 when he's allowed to drink, you know, 21 when he can vote or is it 18 we vote? I don't know, I can't remember. But you know, all of those key significant milestones that Ben's going to go through, he's going to grieve his father again. And as his brain develops, 
and as he gets new understandings of my father died by hanging and suicide and now I am bereft of my father, he's going to get new understandings of this at each different life stages. His brain develops and he gets new meanings. So he might grieve, you know, as, as an eight or nine year old right now, but at 35 he might just go into an absolute you know, sort of uh, deep longing and a yearning for this man who is no longer in his life. And how do I do a 35 year old man? And how do I deal with issues in my life? So he might re-experience the grief again in a way that like Christy was saying, is very unique and individualized. So we have to be very mindful and help people prepare for the oscillations between coping and grieving. With this, where there's a suicide, a significant trauma Trauma overlays this and I often think we've got to do the trauma work first. It's like a cloud that sits over this model and we've first got to help people deal with their trauma and understand that this puts the mind into some place of just not coping. It sort of throws all our schemas and understandings out. So you've got to do your trauma work before you can help people cope with um, coping with change. Uh, thanks Nicola. The next slide. And how do we support the surviving parent? You know, we just don't work with Ben and, you know, his sister, Melissa, but we've got to look at what does mum do? What are, who else is around him and how can we actually put that support in place? And this is where a collaborative multidisciplinary team is absolutely critical because not one clinician can do all of this good work for the whole family, the school, and also other people affected by this. You know, we need to work with our GPs, the psychologists, you know, find other allied health social workers and OTs who are qualified in this work. And I think trauma and grief work is really really unique work and um, you know we've really got to network well and find who can support us all in our work. Having a great relationship with the GP is absolutely critical and I work really closely with a lot of other psychologists because you know we all do something slightly different and you know we can't just be that person for something so complex as child's grief. We also have to be brief with a child, we have to be able to get to a point, you can't go on for an hour and a half about issues, the children's concentration is often quite short, we have to be patient, we have to be consistent, we have to persist and we have to be there, we have to validate this little person and his family and I think that's uh, the biggest part of grief work. Thanks Nicola. Thank you. Thank you all, that was Wonderful. Um, sorry, I was absorbed listening to everything that, that you were saying and uh, so impressed with your timing. So that, fantastic to hear all of your perspectives. Um, and the great thing is we now have time for some Q&A. So I want to thank everybody that sent through their multiplicity of questions um, at registration and also those that are, that are coming through um, on the from the Q&A. So I'm going to open it up to the panel. Um, I'll direct a question to, to each of you, um, but uh, if others have uh, wisdom that they would like to share, um, I would love to invite you to, to do so. Um, I'm going to start with you, Andrew, if that's okay. Um, we've had a question on the Q&A from Wendy about GPs and continuing continuity of care in the current circumstances with COVID and how can GPs I suppose prioritise or advocate for continuity of care either? Do you think it's important that it has to be face to face, the same GP? What do you think are the most important priorities in working with a family like Ben's? So COVID has really changed how we do work in general practice mm. um, and I, I have found that the additional telehealth item numbers that we are using have been very helpful in the mental health space and the ability to touch base with um, patients through telehealth, um, perhaps on a more regular basis than we would be able to see them face to face has been a good little bridge to check in on them and check that they're okay and have a quick phone chat or, or even a longer phone chat um, and having, having that available to us um, and um, having an item number we can use is really beneficial. So continuity, and, and continuity has been harder in the sense that we are actually probably busier now. It's harder to fit people in. We're all time poor. Some of this work takes a lot longer and is a lot more um, time consuming, but a lot heavier as well and, and can, can be exhausting. So, you know, you have to look after yourself as well. But um, I, I try to work a bit ahead and think a bit ahead and for... A patient like Ben, I would say, you know, booking two, three, four weeks in advance, having that booking in place, getting him to book every month or every fortnight, making sure those long, those bookings are long appointments, 
with fill-in gaps with the telehealth item numbers. We will make it work and we'll get there eventually. Um, and, and, and navigating the, the schedule if they ring in a bit of a crisis and having a reception that's really good at working out when they might need to be squeezed in on the day. Um, and that's just part of our job. We just have to sometimes do that and run a mm. bit later and, and fit in these people even when we're fully booked. But as I said, um, there's usually a way to get there before you get to that, that mm. point. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. I think, yeah, this year has taught us um, adaptability and, and, and not, it's not always bad to do things over the phone or, um, you know, some people actually prefer it. So thank you. Um, we will crack through some of the questions. We have over 900 people um, online, which is fantastic. So apologies if we don't get to everybody's individual questions. We'll try and kind of group them together in themes. We had one that came through um, from the registrations, which I might throw to you first, Christy. Um, but Julianne, you might also have something to um, add, I'm sure. And the question is, what role do you see for expressive therapies in children dealing with grief? Yeah, um, I think they're so important, particularly with children. Um, children really like relax, I guess in that setting, it's a bit more familiar to them. We know with kids often when big stuff happens, they reenact that in their play as a way of trying to process it. So being able to use expressive therapies um, in the counseling room can be so helpful. Um, it's a language that children are really familiar with. And so whether that's through drawing or art or music um, or writing or storytelling, whether that's through play therapy, um, yeah, it's often a good way of connecting with a child and it's a good way of them taking ownership of their story and processing some of their questions around it and some of their feelings around it as well. Often as they reenact that in play or expression, um, again, the intensity shifts, it drops down and they can take on that ownership of it a bit better. Fantastic. Julianne, do you see a role, you work with expressive therapies a lot? Yes, yeah, I really agree with Christy too. I think it's really important. It's very much important to um, find out for the child also, you know, what their interests or their likes and dislikes. But for the little boys particularly, they don't, I find they don't do a lot of eye contact talking work very well. And, you know, they really get very fidgety and bored very quickly. So I think shifting it, changing it, being prepared, you know, having your box of little, you know, special things next to you. And, and I use a lot of um, puppets. Um, I do have just started introducing juggling into my um, little repertoire as a form of, you know, breathing technique and, and you know, interspersing things into the therapy uh, or getting up and moving, trying to make it interactive as possible. Mm. Um, I don't, I personally don't do a lot of work around art or other forms of expressive work, but just try to have props in the room that might, you know, shift from the intensity of, you know, one-on-one -on -one talking therapies, which I think, you know, someone like Ben is a bit young for. Mm. I think the um, the side by side sometimes works well, and I think it, uh, in my experience they like it quite a lot. If you're not very good at something like juggling, so <laughs> they and they can kind of enjoy enjoy that. So that's fantastic. Thank you. I've got a quick question um, that anybody is welcome to answer from Catlin. How soon after a person's death can a healthcare team begin to support a child and family? She's an OT, and it had some information that they can't work with grief until after 12 months. Anyone want to care to say whether or not they think that that's... I'd love to comment if I could. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Oh, look, isn't it just so interesting? There's, there's lots of schools of thought that said don't do anything till after the funeral, don't start for six months, you've got to wait for 12 months. And, you know, there's different diagnostic criteria as to when grief becomes a problem or if it's not a problem. Look, I think when someone reaches out, um, you know, uh, you know, if you've got a relationship with a family, you know, especially like I, like I live in a rural community and sort of, you know, things that happen like this are very well known. I don't think there's a right time or a wrong time. I think when people reach out to you is the right time. Uh, regardless if it's the day of the death, the day after the death, or whenever, I think you just have to sit with the person and be appropriate. Um, if our work is trauma-informed, we're not going to do more harm. If we're very conscious of not saying, oh, so I heard your father died for hanging, or if we go in and say, oh, you must be grieving, if we sit with the person and the child, the family, and really just hold the space, then we're not going to do more harm. And I think people's fear is they're going to create sadness. We will make them sad they are sad leaning into the sadness is what we do as clinicians is show that we can hold this sad grief and not, one thing i say to all my students i have here too never offer tissues 
anyone tonight take away do not ever offer tissues to a person have them on the table have bucket loads in the room but never offer someone a tissue when they're crying just think about what it does it says wipe up your snot clean your face up and get yourself into gear so it stops the conversation because they're wiping up you know if they're snotting and doing all this stuff just put up with it let the tears flow and sit with the grief i love that thank you thank you they kind of it, it breaks it yeah go christy yeah, I was just going to say, I can. I just wanted to add to that too. Um, the other thing as well is if a family member contacts, even if the death has just happened, it can be really important to be able to have some of those conversations with the adult, um, whether that is around should the kids attend the funeral or how should I talk to them about that or how should I explain that this person has died. So often um, parents can feel really out of their depth in knowing how to have those conversations with their kids and what to say. And so it can be really important if they if they are reaching out in those early stages um, for support. So I think that can be really, really important time because that's often when they're so overwhelmed with everything and they're just mm. trying to figure out how to even get through things. Um, but around like, I guess, counselling and support for, for kids, you know, I, I'm, quite open to seeing them again similar to what um julianne was saying whenever they kind of reach out mm. i think it's important to work with that um i think when i do see a family that's grieving depending on, on the situation but i'd probably put a little bit of space in between their appointments so life is kind of happening in between as well um but then again if it's if they're in high distress then it's easy to pull their appointments back to being a lot closer um, but yeah, I, I think it's just important to go with the family timeline. Yeah, fantastic. So I think that's a, a, a question people often have, timelines. When should we do this? How long does it go on? When will people, and there's really no timelines for grief, is there? It's, it's, a, it's an iterative process and all of us have had grief of some, some type in our life, whether it's a loss of a relationship or, or a loved one. And, it, and we know that it can kind of creep up on us and ambush us at different times. There have been a number of questions and comments around other types of grief and we have stuck to the brief tonight around grief through bereavement but we do want to just recognize that people experience grief and loss through a whole lot of other experiences but in the interest of tonight and trying to kind of give you guys the detail we need we are we are kind of sticking to the to this circumstance one of the other questions that came through I'm going to throw to you Andrew if that's okay is a bit about the the balance and differentiation um, not necessarily in this case study I'm going back on what I just said but the the different distinguishing between adults how do you navigate the space of adults' grief and their children's grief and if their ability to see that, you know, to see the behaviours or to see the things that are that are going on, whether it's the regressions or the aggression, sensitively, if that makes sense? Oh, uh, that's, yeah, it's a very tricky question. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to interpret the question as um, what's the difference between adults going through grief and children going through grief. How do you grief? broach with an adult that their child is experiencing, their behaviours are grief if, if their oh. adult's own grief is perhaps stopping them from seeing that? Mm. So that, um, Melissa, the mum, and in, in general terms, I would definitely want to see the parent or caregiver on their own as well to have their time to talk through what's going on for them and to talk through what they're going through with their child and the impact it's having on the family as a whole. Um, so the, the, the caregiver, the mum, Melissa, she needs her own appointment. She needs her own support. She needs her own assessment mm -hmm. and referrals, as we said. Um, and in terms of educating her on this, you know, I, I think it's best just to be honest and upfront about what you're thinking and let her know Ben is experiencing or your child is experiencing a wide range of emotional reactions to a significant change in life. And there may or may not be some kind of mental health problem that's coming from that. We are, we are trying to gather that information and work through it systematically. Um, but it, that again, like that first slide, it's a very normal reaction to have. And in children, it can be very different to adults. And it can be a behavioural change as, as Ben is experiencing. It can be a physical symptom as Ben is experiencing as well. So mm -hmm. he kind of fits all those boxes. But, yep. but in, in general, she needs her own time. She needs her own consultation. Um, and it is hard work. And if, mm -hmm. if mum can't fit that in, I'll ask her to go away and write things down and send them to me so that I can have a look at what she's thinking. Because it's mm -hmm. not always easy to converse 
when you've got the child and the mother present. Mm. It's, it's, um, it's not always easy to, to have some of those big discussions about those emotions and, and, and mum might want to talk about things privately. Mm. Um, but as being as open and honest as possible, I think is probably the best answer to that. Yeah, it's great. Not, not shying away from, from what you're thinking and what, mm. you're, what you're wondering about um, and what, what they're wondering about. And I wonder also, Andrew, that, that you're talking about psychoeducation there, which you raised in, in your talk about how children experience grief differently from children. And there's been some questions um, about resources, and there certainly will have those in the resources section. Um, and there are some really good resources around how children experience grief at different ages and stages across that social and emotional and behavioural. And, and they can be really helpful, I think, sometimes too, perhaps to give to mum to take away and have a bit of a look at. So it's kind of tangible so maybe mm. yeah providing some of that but, yeah have a look at the resources um, mm. and recognize that each age has its own sort of presentation and experience mm. and mm. we're dealing with an eight-year-old today but it's completely different for a four-year-old and it's completely different for a zero a, a newborn mm. every, every child I think will have some kind of emotional response to what to a, a significant life event such as this but it's finding those responses working with them and, and figuring out if they are responses that need to be managed in any way or whether we can just support them through the process and educate. So, yeah, have a look at those resources. That's great. Thank you. We also had lots of questions, um, and I open this up again, but uh, Christy and Julianne might, in particular might uh, be able to assist with this from people working in educational settings, so school counsellors, guidance counsellors and so forth, um, any advice for them in terms of their role and how they might intersect with the kind of work you guys do and what role they might play in supporting someone like Ben in the school setting? Who wants to take it? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at, I'm at, Christy, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy Go to Christy first and then we'll throw okay. to you, Julianne, to add <laughs> um, Okay, so I guess one of the biggest roles that um, school psychologists can play is just being able to, to link in and create a space where that child can go um, to, to be able to talk if they want or just even to have a time out if they need that, um, if they're feeling really overwhelmed or if they're feeling um, distressed or that they can't concentrate. It's just important for them to just have that space where they can kind of regroup a little bit um, and just giving them permission that if they want to talk that they can and that you're there to hear and understand. Um, I think the other part that um, school counsellors um, and guidance counsellors play is being able to give teachers information around um, grief um, and around the child and how they, they're going. Um, sometimes teachers might not be as aware or they might see the child as presenting like they're doing quite well and just not, I guess, seeing the bigger picture of how the grief is impacting on them. Um, particularly like in Ben's case, we it impacted on sleep and stuff like that. It could just be really important to to have some of those conversations with some of his teachers if he's really struggling with getting assignments done on time or sitting in exams or or even just keeping up with the school work and content. Um, and I guess, I guess how they can liaise with us externally, it would be if they know that um, one of the, the students is seeing someone outside the school, um, just being able to get in contact with us or get in contact through, it, through the family and then once we're able to liaise with consent and everything like that, mm. it would be um, a really good bridge that we can then provide you more information or if there's areas that you guys are concerned about or if there's any struggles or questions or anything like that, then we can step into a bit of that gap and we can give mm. you some information around how to support them and support the family as well as possible. Um, and just also for us to be able to support you in that role as well. Hmm. I think that can help as well because then Ben can have one set of tools that he can draw on if they can learn. We've been working with Ben on this about when he's feeling these ways or the strategies to calm down or that if the educators are aware of that, then he's not being told 10 different, different things, things by the different different people. And that's great. Thank you. Did, Julianne, did you have anything to add? Look, what Chrissy said was really fabulous and you, you backed up there, Nicola, as well. Mm. Um, yeah, it is really that, um, that link and the educative role is really critical and also um, just keeping the 
the focus too on anniversaries and you know because mm. the child will you know Ben will go into another year next year and ensuring that Melissa or anywhere like you know as we said we're talking about the case study but at my experience is that the, when the child goes into this next class year people have forgotten there might be a new mm. teacher a new environment and I think a really important thing is for whoever's in the school welfare team is to keep that front and center that that little boy or that little person will actually have a reaction at some point there'll be a trigger a community event or something that could create um, a situation for him or a reaction that's not quite expected. So it's keeping that the finger on the pulse. Mm -hmm. and, and also for other children in the school that have actually had similar experiences or deaths, um, what I've seen too is sometimes there's a bit of a, um, a death uh, comparison. You know, my death's more important than your death. Mm -hmm. You know, that my, um, my little brother died harder than yours or my daddy died by hanging, but your daddy, you know, it's, there can be that being aware of what's happening in the social media space, being aware of what's been, and take it seriously, mm -hmm. I think is important. Mm -hmm. But that continuity between classes is critical. Mm, that's mm. a really excellent point. Thank you, Julianne. Yeah, yes. go, Christy. Yeah, sorry. And then I'll go to you, Andrew. <laughs> Julianne just totally triggers something else for me as well. Um, so one of the things that we often talk to families about that would be really important for schools to be aware as well is if it's a parental death around Mother's Day and Father's Day, um, often it's something that teachers kind of struggle with of going, well, do, do we include them? Do we not? Do we get them to still do a card or, or to do this for that parent or not? Do we get them to do it for someone else? Um, and it can be really difficult, especially when, you know, there's a little marketplace around Mother's or Father's Day or dads or parents come in for it. Um, and so often what we say to um, schools around that is kind of have a bit of that conversation one-on-one -on -one with the child if possible and just get their input and follow their lead. So if they feel comfortable um, doing that, that would, you know, that's great. If they go, mm, no, I just want to opt out, that's completely fine too. If you're feeling like the child's just kind of a bit put on the spot, um, let them know that they can talk to the, the caregiver about it some more and you can touch base with them to find out what their preference is. Um, and it's such an important conversation for parents to be having with their kids as well, mm -hmm. um, just to really get a sense of what the child wants to do around some of those big dates, whether that's anniversary or whether it's Mother's Day, Father's Day or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it can just be really important because they're kind of a bit of overwhelming days. Um, mm -hmm. And just the other thought that jumped into my head as well as Julianne was talking um, is just also around some of the bullying. We're finding that bereaved kids are often getting bullied just because they are quite different. Um, it can be that they're getting more attention or they're getting exemptions from doing stuff. And so some kids start to target them or to start to pick on them because mm. they're, oh, they're getting all this special attention and stuff like that. Um, and just because they're different, their family looks different or their mm. experience is quite different. And so it's just also being aware of, of that side of things and just keeping an eye out and addressing that early on if possible. Fantastic. Got a couple of minutes to go. Andrew, you want to add something? Oh, really just reflecting exactly what Christy and Julianne have said mm. about school. I think GPs definitely have a, an important role to, to keep the school linked in with the process. Um, not always easy. And I, I probably would say we, we don't do it very well. Um, but if we can somehow notify or talk to teachers or, or, or offer a, um, a correspondence to the staff, the teachers that are looking after the child can make a big difference. And I wasn't aware of the, the impact that exemptions and things can have on, on a child, but you know, even just suggesting um, if there's some kind of extension or support in some way that can offer them more more time to complete tasks, you know, now that they have this impact, this concentration problem. Mm, thank you. But time for one more quick question, and it's a doozy, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there's lots of questions around cultural considerations. And, and one of the things I thought maybe, um, just to narrow it down a little bit, is we've given advice, Julianne, you were speaking tonight about frankness, I suppose, and use and language and so forth. How do you navigate that with the family if culturally or just in their own norms that, that that's, they're very avoidant of that or they're very resistant to that? What would be your approach? So you've got kind of a way you like to work, but perhaps mm. the family and um, aren't comfortable discussing, say, death in that language or suicide, for example. Mm. Really good question, Nicola, and a really important um, the, uh, consideration all of us need to have. And I think you've got to ask first. And if you can't ask the family because the intensity of the grief, you actually go to other trusted people that might know what are the culturally expected norms. And this is where we link up with the school and find out, you know, what, what are the things that we need to know about this particular family or this particular cultural group or issues that might be impacting on, on how 
you know, whether you know, regardless of the culture or regardless of the, um, you know, the background of the family, is find out, and and be respectful of it. And it's just critical. We can still challenge things gently as you build relationships, because if some um, customs or practices aren't necessarily helpful or in, you know, sort of, you know, in the children's best interests, we can gently challenge them, but not until you've built trust and relationship with that family by appreciating the cultural norms, but getting to know them first. You know, saying, how do you do grief? You know, what do you do when people die? What words do you use? Getting to ask them first. Mm. Christy, do you have anything to add to that? If you have, um, when you're working with different cultures and values around their view of, of death and grieving? Yes, yeah. so I, I agree with everything that Julianne said. And um, I think, you know, they would be finding this in different settings as well, if they've got a different culture or if they've got a different um, religion or belief system or anything like that. And so what we kind of find is they're normally quite happy to, to talk about that or educate us. And so it's coming from that perspective, like Julianne was saying, of going, you know, I want to understand it from your perspective. What's important for me to know about your beliefs or your culture? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what what is their awareness around it and what does that look like and what language do they kind of use? And so it's kind of following their lead a little bit and um, just being really observant and taking in how they speak about the person or what that looks like. Um, I know in some, I think, Aboriginal communities, sometimes they don't even say the person's name once they die. And so, you know, it can also be helpful for us to have a bit of an idea about some different cultures and some different belief systems around that. But, of course, we're not going to know all of them. And so it is just mm. questioning and maybe putting that framework out early on of just saying, Oh, I don't actually know a lot about what, how you got, like how your culture grieves or what that looks like or what traditions you have. Is it okay if I ask questions or I apologise if I make assumptions? Um, and so when you put that out early, often they're, they're quite generous in, in sharing or correcting or, or coming back to you with the extra mm. information. Mm. Fantastic. I think assumptions are what trip us up, aren't they, that we might um, know. So asking, I think, with a genuine interest in listening it and adapting our work to be respectful is, is a great place to start. There's so many more questions, we can't get to them. Um, but thank you guys so much. We do have a couple of minutes for each of you to, to sum up. So I wonder, if you, Andrew, just to, to sum up some of the key messages um, in working in this sort of circumstance with a family um, experiencing this grief, what would you... Sure. Wrap up with. I, I, I would say the GP is often one of the first points of call that a family such as this would present when they are dealing with struggles and difficulties. And as a GP, um, it's important just to listen, to engage that family, to, to talk to your patient, the child, and to, to use age appropriate language um, and to help them sort out where, what those emotions are and where they're coming from and find out the key impacts on, on that family as a whole but also not forgetting that you also might need to involve mum and, and other members of that family. Um, the, the other part of our job is to then navigate a collaborative approach through involving other care professionals, whether it is a psychologist or a social worker, as we've heard from tonight, or another professional such as another, another um, uh, medical professional such as a psychiatrist or a paediatrician, and to really connect those dots together. Um, or whether we need to just hold this family and see them regularly. So it's absolutely okay to do a mental health care plan if you're worried and you think they need more support. It's, it's, it's fine to do a referral, to not have all that on yourself and to have help from others and, um, and to be you know, part of that process and support mm. the family through. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think it's a really good point. We haven't talked a lot about it, but self-care is obviously really important in this work. Um, so, yeah, making sure that we get the, the support that we need when we're, we're sitting with and walking with people through these difficult circumstances. Christy, have you got a couple of key takeaways that you'd like to share with us? Cool. Um, okay. So I guess grief, you know, it's, it's chaotic. It can often bring up a lot of feelings of, feeling a bit out of our, our depth at times or that things are a little bit um, intense. And I think one of the biggest gifts you can give someone is just being there in, in your presence um, to be able to listen and just to be able to hold that space and for someone to know they're not alone. Um, I think in particular with, with Ben's case, you know, open communication in, in the family is so important and makes such a big difference in just that feeling of safety and connection. Um, sharing memories is so important. 
often when someone dies, you know, friends, families, even in schools and stuff, people kind of go, oh, but if I bring up their name, I'm going to upset them. Or if I share a memory, that's going to upset them. But the reality is they're upset anyway, whether mm-hmm. they're showing it or not. And talking about the person won't upset them because they're already upset but it will actually show them that you you care and that you remember and that you feel sad that that person's not here anymore as well. Mm. Um, and so I think that can be such an important thing that if you knew the person to be able to talk about them, um, yeah, I think that makes such a huge difference. Mm. So they're probably my main takeaways. <laughs> That's wonderful. I think it's a really good point. I think a number of the people that I know and work with that have experienced grief, actually one of the most hurtful things is people avoiding them. Um, for fear of upsetting them, but actually by avoiding them, they find that really hurtful and you don't have to have the right thing to say. There's no right thing to say necessarily, as you say, versus kind of leaning in and, and um, yeah, be expressing a, a, a care for somebody. But um, we can feel very uh, frightened of doing that, forget saying the wrong thing, and that can, that can also um, be hurtful. So thank you. I think that's a really good point. Uh, Julianne. Yeah, Nicola, that was such a good point you made then too is, um, you know, we just need to, as clinicians, letting people know that some of these things might happen and prepare them for uh, situations that might, you know, take their breath away. Mm. Um, look, something I've started doing a little bit more with young children and just to share with you tonight is a little bit more about brain science and explaining to little people just what's going on in their brains when they can't work things out. And I had one little boy the other night was saying, I just was banging my head. I said, that must feel so awful for you. He said, no, it makes it better. It stops it hurting. So we explored his thing. And I said, do you know what happens in your brain when you, know, when you can't think and you're stressed? And he was, when we, we took the, the focus away from his grief to something really tangible and understandable. And, you know, he really got engaged in some understanding as um, some other stuff that I might not have actually introduced to somebody so young and I was really quite pleased and I've done it again this week to another young person and found that they really were fascinated by the fact that you know their brain tries to protect them from bad feelings bad thoughts so that's why your brain feels this and sometimes we act and hit and do things because behavior is communication Mm -hmm. and if we can't have words then we act and so sometimes putting it in these simple terms and then giving them some strategies so why do I feel so awful well you know this is what's happening in your brain Um, and I think another thing we need to as um, modern day clinicians is think about the food and mood connection and maybe that's an exploration if you're not eating properly you're not going to get the right hormones if you're not going to get the right neurotransmitters and maybe that's an exploration like Andrew said you know work collaboratively maybe dietitians are needed as well or looking at his diet and uh, maybe that's something that um, yeah can be added to our suite of things we Mm. offer but I think um, yeah just it's it's don't be an expert Um, Mm. have all your knowledge you know be like that zen warrior know where you come from and act from a point of not knowing Mm. thank you I think that I mean we're going into other topics but I think that's that the brain science I mean it's taught in kindies you know, these days around, somebody was talking to me about it, that their kindy child, they talked about the wise owl, as in the, you know, prefrontal cortex and the the, the, the barking dog as the amygdala and kind of that how that works. And kids got it really well and it gave them some sense of agency of understanding why in certain circumstances they respond the way they do and why these other skills that we're working with you on in terms of getting the wise owl to fly back to the nest um, can be helpful. So we underestimate kids all the time. I think in terms of how they how they feel and how they um, intuit and what they know what's going on, but also that the agency they can have to um, understand what's going on. Mm, um, point. We're going to have to leave it there. I could listen to this stuff all night, um, but I do have to eat and so does everybody else. <laughs> um, I really want to thank the panellists for a wonderful presentation on a really important topic um, tonight. I think it was fantastic and I, I, I know from the feedback people have been um, messaging through that it was it was really helpful. So thank you everybody, um, Julianne, Andrew and Christy. It was a wonderful to hear from you and your, your expertise. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We cracked 900 um, viewers, which is pretty impressive, I think, for a Thursday night in, in December. So thank you, everyone, that joined. Um, we would love you to complete the feedback. Again, we have the exit survey. The platform's a little bit different tonight. So the exit survey, if you click on the pie chart, 
which is in the lower right hand corner of your screen next to the speech bubble to fill out the survey that would be great or you will get a message to pop up on your screen after the webcast ends. So just to let everybody know that after tonight you will get some follow-up communication from us, you will get um, some detail and information um, with the recording of the activity and the resources and so forth. We will get um, a statement of attendance, as you see, um, will be sent out within four weeks. Tonight's webinar was the last for 2020. Uh, so I think it was scheduled initially for maybe February, it feels like. Um, there's a, a few little things that have got in the way since then, so we're glad to have been able to do it. It's been a very difficult year for, for everybody and MHPN are really pleased you'll be able to um, continue to provide professional development for you all. We're working on the 2021 program and it promises to great, be great. So. The second MHPN conference, if any of you participated in that, that was fantastic, will be in June 2021, so keep an eye out and save the date. And we will continue to provide uh, webinars on children. Uh, there's a partnership with Emerging Minds that will continue to do that. And over the holidays, you can catch up on MHPN Presents podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or on the website. All right, I think that brings us to pretty much the end tonight. Before I close, one final acknowledgement, I would like to acknowledge the lived experience of people and carers who have lived with me mental illness in the past and for those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you everyone for participating this evening and I hope you get to have a restful and incident-free holiday period. Thanks very much. <laughs>